Good morning. My name is Kate Kirkwood. I want to welcome you to a parent's five-step guide to lead poisoning. I'll start by just uh, talking a little bit about my background. Uh, back in the early 2000s, I was a single mom with four young kids. I was a college business professor and uh, I was looking for a little bit of side work, you know, make a little extra money, got got college to pay for for my own kids coming up, that sort of thing. And I was doing some um, consulting for private entities. And one of the groups that reached out to me was the city of Manchester. And their situation was that they had a, a young girl who had died of lead poisoning in the year 2000. Her name was Sunday Abeck. And there's lots of good information out there about her. Happy to talk with you about her if you'd like to know the story. But what happened to me was it changed my life. You know, I was a mom with young kids and I came in and I heard about this problem. I knew nothing about lead paint, like many parents, I'm afraid. I just didn't realize what a big problem it was. And when I heard that a little girl died, I started thinking, how could this be? Didn't we solve this problem back in the 50s? Clearly we didn't. As far as I know, Sunday is still the most recent documented death of childhood lead poisoning in the country. And it was right here in New Hampshire. I'm going to tell you in a little bit how we also have, as far as I know, the most recent adult lead poisoning death in the country, right here in New Hampshire. We have a big problem in New Hampshire and it's not going away anytime soon. Over the next couple of years, that changed my career. I stopped teaching college and I built a consulting business around lead. I got, I'm a pretty decent grant writer from all my years in academia. So I got uh, the chance to write some grants and bring some money into the state and uh, I was, privilege to run the Manchester Childhood Lead Poisoning, Lead Poisoning Prevention Program for five years and learned a lot. I used the grant money to get all the certifications it's possible to have. I, I either now hold or have held seven different lead licenses, national as well as state. So I've learned a lot about the rules. And my job now is to teach you the rules. But I tell you the truth, I don't think the rules are the answer. I don't think all the regulations and fines in the world are going to solve this problem. We don't have enough. We don't have enough inspectors. We don't have enough people out there, you know, finding to make that much difference. This, if we're gonna solve this problem, this is going to come from well-meaning, loving parents, and it's gonna come from an army of educators, doctors, lawyers, contractors, property owners. We all have to learn about this problem, understand how easy it is to fix it, and then get out there and do it. It's just general renovation. It's basically what we're already doing to keep our properties looking good, but it's doing it in a lead safe way. And it's testing everybody, the kids and the parents. So I wanna thank Nashua for having me here today. I, I'm very fortunate as I've been going through this over the last almost 20 years now, I guess, I've had the opportunity to speak to, I don't know, hundreds of groups. I've been able to write a couple of books. Uh, you can find my books on Amazon, they're cheap. They're, this is not meant to be a money-making thing. I wanna say sometimes this book, the one that we're talking about right here, I, I know it sells for like $8 or something in hard copies, very cheap. But also the the, um, the video version, the um, the Kindle version is often free. And if anything, it's two or $3. So, so this is cheap. If you'd like to get more information, please go to my website, leadpaintclearandsimple.com. That will direct you to the TED Talk, to all the free videos we have on YouTube, and also to the to couple of books. I've written, in addition to this one, oh, I guess I can go to the next slide, right? In addition to this one, uh, I've written a children's book about lead called Skylar Learns About Lead Poisoning. And those are my children um, some years ago now. They've all grown up. but um, And that's me also some years ago. Um, but what I, I started by writing, actually the first book I wrote was called Terry Learns About Lead Poisoning. The idea was to have a, a, a book about a child, not gender specific, not um, not specific to any kind of, oh, thanks, Samantha's put the link in the chat, um, not specific to any particular nationality or neighborhood, but to understand that this is a problem everywhere. And although we talk a lot about lead in the paint and lead in the dust, the truth is there's lead available in China, in, in dishes, in, um, in stained glass. There's lead available in, in uh, mini blinds. I mean, the list goes on and on. So the, the children's book was uh, full of colorful pictures and sort of an interesting little story about someone coming home from school and talking to mom about what they learned in school today. And it's cute and you can read it to little ones, but it's really aimed at the caregiver who's reading it. It's really aimed at mom or dad or the babysitter or grandma or whoever's reading this um, to learn about lead. 
So I hope that you'll pick up one of the books if you uh, if you can. But if not, um, it, go look at the websites. There's a lot of good uh, free information there. And visit the exhibits, not just mine, but there's so much good information here. I went to all, all the exhibits this morning. Um, it's exciting in New Hampshire to see how much grant money we just got. We just got about $10 million in the state. Gosh, I'm so excited. I've never seen so much money in the state in all these years that I've been working here to uh, to help us with this problem. Now is the time to get your properties cleaned up, whether it's a single family home that you own and you live in yourself or investment property or whatever. Um, please, you know, look into these grant programs right now. There's so much money and it's exciting. Also, if you need training, if you need certification, uh, we're offering over in my booth, we're offering up $50 off any class, you know, if you register here at the conference. But separate from us, the grant programs are offering some free training. So get out there and take a look at what's around. If you need training, now's the time. All right. So I'm going to ask you first, are you lead poisoned? When parents pick up a book, to talk about lead poisoning, they think it's it's something they should worry about for their children, and you should. But much like the airlines who will tell you, you know, when you're doing their safety talks and you're sitting on the runway, they'll tell you if there's a problem, put on your own oxygen mask first before you try and take care of those kids. And I'm gonna say the same thing. Get your own blood tested. Find out if you are lead poisoned before you start worrying about the kids. In fact, you can get tested together. It's a family affair. So why would you be lead poisoned? Well, if you live in an older home, nine out of 10 houses built before 1940 have lead. Nine out of 10. Even if your house was built in the 50s or 60s, you still have a 70% chance. And between 1960 and 1978, about a 25% chance. So if your house was built before 1978, check it out. If it's built before 1940, you can just assume there is lead. All right, so maybe you live in an older home, but even if you don't, even if you live in a new home, you could very well be lead poisoned and your children could be getting lead poisoned. And so here are some of the reasons why. If you're renovating your own home or somewhere else, you know, I, I have a, a client that I worked with who's an attorney in Dover, New Hampshire, and he got lead poisoned by doing renovations on a, a summer home, a summer cottage that he bought up in Winnipesaukee. Now, he lived in Dover. He's lived in a new home in Dover with his family, but went up there and worked on weekends, brought lead dust back home, and the entire family had lead levels. So, I, 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 another example, similar example, I worked with a client in Manchester, who lived in a relatively new home and didn't understand why all three of his children were showing up with high lead levels. And when I got to the house, I didn't imme immediately understand it either. It was a new home, well-maintained. There shouldn't have been any reason for this until we got to the workshop that he had set up in the basement. And it became clear that this family as a hobby, you know, as a family adventure, would go out and shop at yard sales, at estate sales, at antique shops, and they would bring this stuff home. And he and the kids would work on these projects in their basement. They made some beautiful things and poisoned all the family. So if you work in an old building, you could be bringing this stuff home from your office or your business every day. If your hobbies include renovation or antiquing or collecting, you could be in a situation where you're bringing this stuff home to your family. Sometimes it's just where we buy things, you know, and it doesn't have to be yard sales or antique shops. Um, this past year, again, this has happened, I think, three times in the last five years. This past year, we found a crib sold on Amazon painted with lead. And the reason for that is that some countries do not have the same standards that we have in this country. And because our culture is so international, right, we buy from anywhere, we have access to things that come into this country and prices are good. And we're excited about their, you know, designs or their pricing or whatever it is, but they don't necessarily have the same legislation. So be, uh, be careful about where you're buying and look, just look at the labels. Typically there are labeling laws. Um, one of the things we often see is uh, inexpensive toys, right? Things that you might buy at the dollar store are, uh, can be painted with lead. I'm not saying they all are, but read the box. Often they will say something about lead hazard on the box. So just be careful. And there are ways to test. We'll get to that in a minute. I, I, let me just say, I have a TED talk. Um, 
Uh, if you go, to, it's free. If you go to our leadpaintclearandsimple.com or you go to our exhibit space here at the at the conference, um, the talk is there. It's 10 minutes. I think it's actually 13 minutes altogether. Um, and you can watch not only a, a big discussion about lead, but the title of the topic of the of the talk is why you should worry about lead poisoning in a new home. It's not just old homes. And one of the things I did, one of the things that TED folks asked me to do is to actually test visually on stage. So I, I, I have on stage with me a little black rocking chair, a little antique rocking chair, a picture frame, a couple of dishes, a little statue, and I test them all right in front of you on stage and show you that they have led. So, so check it out and you'll see, and I'll tell you a secret that you wouldn't know by watching the TED talk. That black rocking chair was my grandmother's and those dishes came out of my house. So we could all have lead in our homes and not even know it. This is just stuff that was handed down from generations. That was my grandmother's mixing bowl. You know, when I was a kid, we used to bake bread together using that bowl. So you may have these things in your house, no matter what the age of your house is. So it's just something to think about and something to look at, things that you have handed down. I'm not saying you should get rid of them. I'm not asking you to get rid of your family antiques, but maybe put them up on a high shelf for a few years while your kids are little, or maybe use them for flowers instead of food. You'll, you'll, you'll come up with a solution once you understand the problem. So do a little research and I encourage you to start with our YouTube channel. We have a YouTube channel and leadpaintclearandsimple.com links you to all that stuff. It's all free and, and it'll give you a chance to just think. You know, just look at it and think about how it affects you because your situation may be different from mine or different from your next door neighbors. But when you have the information, I have great confidence in, in parents and individuals. We are smart people. If we give you the right information, you will figure out a plan that works for you. Right. And some of that will be in this in the rest of our talk here. We have about a half hour left, so we're going to get this done. All right. Um, next is if you work in automotive or marine paints, meaning you, you do auto repair or you work in, around boats. When we eliminated lead in the paint, it was only for residential use. In other words, the, the way the law is written, it says you after 1978, you cannot manufacture paint for residential use for houses. You can still, and we still do, paint commercial buildings with lead. Schools, factories, town halls can be, and many are, painted with lead. So you could work in a building with lead and you could be bringing that home. More, more importantly, automotive uh, and marine facilities love lead paint because it's really good paint for their use. It inhibits rust. It inhibits the growth of mold and mildew. That's why initially we used lead paint in our kitchens and our bathrooms because it kept down the, the growth of mold. It doesn't allow that stuff to grow. It's, you know, in many ways, it was a really good product. We just didn't know that it poisoned us. So we still use it in those specific industries. So if you work in those industries, that's a problem. Now, let me talk to you a minute about Thomas Kelly. Thomas was, a, he lived in Derry, New Hampshire and was a police sergeant for the Derry Police Force. This was back in the 80s, 1980s. He was 35 years old. And one day his wife found him dead in bed with their toddler in the morning. As far as she knew, he was healthy. So she had an autopsy done and they discovered his cause of death was lead poisoning. What Thomas did for work primarily with the police force is he taught shooting skills to young cops. So he worked in an indoor firing range, teaching them to get really good with their firearms. Unfortunately, the laws around air quality in the indoor firing range was not good. I'll be honest with you, it's still not good. We were hired recently, uh, I won't say where, but in New Hampshire uh, to help a firing range uh, clean up uh, lead dust as they were, they were expanding and moving out of that building into another building. And they wanted to repurpose the building for other uses and to, to get the lead dust cleaned up out of that facility enough that it could be used for something else was just a horrific experience, it took us months. And, and the reason is because that dust is just, it's so fine and it packs into every every little crevice everywhere and cleaning it up is very difficult. So you can imagine the people who work there and it's, you know, it's not macho to wear respirators, right? When you're teaching these folks to, um, to shoot. And so, so what has happened, what happened to him is he just breathed too much of this stuff in. Now that's a lot of years ago and we've learned and we've gotten better at this, but I just want you to understand that this is an area that we still have a lot to learn and there's so much 
to know. Um, so the first thing is think a little bit about the air quality in places that you go. If you if you have hobbies like um, indoor firing ranges, wear a respirator, protect yourself. I think COVID has done a lot to help us think that way, right? So one thing, I, one more thing I want to share with you about this is take home lead is a phrase that you'll see. If you Google take home lead, you start to see about parents bringing lead dust home to their children. There was a study done in the state of Maine in the year 2008. It's called the infant car seat study. You can Google this. I promise I don't make this stuff up. Um, what happened was there were a number of children, I want to say a dozen, that had high lead levels but lived in new homes. And there was no immediate reason why that, that was obvious to investigators as to why these kids would be poisoned. So HUD was involved in this and they were doing dust wipes on the floors. Um, to, to try to find out what was going on with the, these, the houses where these kids lived, you know? And as I said, in, in, I think it was in my earlier talk, if you have a lead mess in your house, like if you've got lead dust in your house, and this could be dust too tiny to see, right? I'm not saying your house is dirty. The, the amount of lead it takes to poison a child is smaller than a grain of sugar, right? This could be tiny, tiny, tiny amounts. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of lead dust. If there's a lot of lead dust in your house, it's on the floor typically because lead is heavy and it settles down. So if we do dust wipes on the floor, we get a good idea of what the situation is in the house. So at the time that HUD did this study, just to give you some numbers, the, um, the failure rate, if you will, for lead dust on the floor was 40, 40 micrograms per square foot. So they take like a baby wipe, you know, a dust wipe, and they then they wipe a square foot and they have a special way to do that, send it off to the lab and the lab analyzes it. And if there's 40 micrograms or more in that square foot, it fails. So what HUD found in this case was the interior of the apartments were fine. The kids' bedrooms and play areas, no problem. But right inside the door, where the, where the people would come in from the outside, right, the main entrance to the apartment, they found very high levels, levels as high as 1,250 micrograms per square foot. You know, this is not rocket science, right? If you, if you look at that for a minute, you realize what had to have happened is someone walked into this apartment or this home with lead dust on their feet. And as they walked through the house, carpets, whatever, they rubbed the stuff off. And by the time they got into the interiors, it was fine. But right inside the doorway, they were leaving very high levels, which now could be picked up by the children as they're coming into the house as well, right? Children get poisoned, as far as we know now, in two ways. They eat it, they breathe it. They ingest it or they inhale it. So either way, either they're crawling around on the carpet and they're getting out of their hands and they're putting their hands in their mouths, or it's getting carried into the house and it's in the air and they're breathing it. And of course, we're creating more in the house too by opening and closing windows and so forth if it's an old house. But these were new houses and that's why this study was so important. Now, there's an easy solution and that's what I want you to see here. And that's what the Parents Five Step Guide is about. This is pretty easy stuff to resolve. It's a pretty, there's pretty easy solutions, really. For example, if you think you might be in the situation I just described, where there's lead dust right inside the doorway, take off your shoes before you walk in the house. You know, many people have that rule anyway, just for cleanliness, right? Let's just leave our shoes outside. So if you think there might be lead dust involved, double up those efforts. Just don't bring it into the house with you, right? And there's lots more. We could talk about HEPAVAX and cleaning, and I'm happy to talk about any of that, but I don't have time in the next 20 minutes to cover it all. Um, I would say, again, the TEDx talk covers a lot of that. So head over there if you haven't seen it yet. Not now, but when we're done. Let me tell you the ending of this study. So they found 1,250 micrograms per square foot inside the doorways, which led them to test outside the doorways. What's the front porch like? You know, what are, the, what are the main hallways if it's an apartment building? What about the driveway? What about the vehicles in the driveway? The highest lead levels they found, up to 2,500 micrograms per square foot, were in the infant car seats in the back of the pickup trucks. I was horrified when I read this study. But you can understand how it happens, right? I mean, mom or dad has to take this this child to daycare so they can go off and work. And if they're painter, contractor, renovator, designer, they work in older buildings, real estate agents, whatever, what happens the rest of the day in that vehicle? It's a work vehicle, right? Blankets or coats or drop cloths or tools go into the back seat, and that infant car seat is just part of the work vehicle for the rest of the day. End of the day, go pick Junior up, push all that stuff out of the way, pop 
the child into the car seat in the middle of a lead mess and poison them on the way home. This is what's happening to these kids. And we just didn't, we just didn't know. Again, well-meaning, loving parents thinking they're doing the right thing, right? They're working hard to support their family. They're dropping the child off at a safe place. They're living in a new home and bringing this poison home with them every day. And in fact, putting the child right in the middle of it. So this is an, a terrible situation, but again, once you understand it, it's not hard to avoid. Somebody else drops the child off at daycare or you know, the car seat gets left with the child or gets washed frequently or whatever. You have to figure out what works for you. But once you understand the problem, you can fix it. These are not difficult issues, really. Thanks, Angela, that's great. You're the best team. This is the best team, aren't they? I love this conference. Okay, if you're lead poisoned as an adult, how would you know? Headaches, headaches are common lead poisoning symptoms for everybody, for kids as well as adults. And there's reasons, medical reasons for that. Many people here are much more qualified than I to talk about that. My understanding is it has to do with the red blood cells and how when lead travels in the red blood cells, there's not as much room for oxygen. So, uh, you know, oxygen sort of gets squeezed out and we get headaches or in the, in the case of the little ones, brain damage from this situation. I just know, I work with a lot of lead poisoned adults actually, because OSHA has a rule. If you're a lead abatement contractor and you work around lead all the time, OSHA requires that you have blood tests every so often. And if your level is over a certain amount, they have to take you off the job site until you can bring your lead level back down. So in that situation, sometimes the contractor, the owner of the, of the company will hire someone like me to help them come in and figure out, you know, how are these folks getting so poisoned? What can we do to bring their lead levels down? quickly. And I love doing that kind of work because it's very specific. You know, I can help people immediately get better. Um, just like working with kids when their levels are tiny and we can catch them early. So same with adults. I've worked with a lot of lead poison adults and I will tell you that they most often have headaches. That's a very common symptom. Also digestive problems seems to be common. My stomach is acting up all the time. Uh, they'll say things like, I used to be able to eat all this spicy food and I can't do it anymore. You know, that kind of thing. Joint pain. Any joint can be affected by lead. The lead actually kind of eats away at the joints. But I believe that the most um, common and the most difficult probably are wrists and ankles. I worked with a lead inspector recently who has um, permanent foot drop from high lead levels, not in New Hampshire, in another state. But um, but he's at the point now where we've got his lead level down quite a bit. But uh, but when he's tired, he still you know can't quite pick up his foot. You know his wrist doesn't quite work right anymore. The sex piece. We have to talk about this for a minute. Um, Lead affects the reproductive organs of both, the reproductive system of both men and women. We know that women who are exposed to lead have higher miscarriage rates, women who work in the, in the lead industry. That's easily documented these days. But what a lot of people don't realize is it often has much more to do with his work than hers. If you, even if she's not exposed, we still see high miscarriage rates among women whose partners work around lead. The reason for that is that lead affects sperm count. It, it, it creates abnormal and reduced sperm in younger guys. And in older guys, it is um, one of the causes of erectile dysfunction. So we'll get your attention one way or another, right? <laughs> so here's the thing, though. If you are, if a woman, a young couple is trying to get pregnant, he works around lead, she's more likely to miscarry, even though she may have no direct exposure herself. Lots of good research out there about that. We can talk about it. High blood pressure is a common um, symptom for, for lead poisoning, but the hardest one is what the doctors call general malaise. You know, I'm just, I just don't feel good. I'm just always feeling blah. I feel like I'm coming down with something all the time. And it's, maybe it's allergies, we, you know, physical fatigue. Okay, I'm just tired all the time. And it's so easy to say, I don't know, I'm getting old. Maybe I'm not getting enough sleep. I guess I'm just tired. I, I don't know. I'm kind of down about things right now. You know, it's so easy to blame it on something else, but it's also easy to find out. Get a blood test. All you have to do is ask your doctor when you go for your physical, it's not standard procedure. They don't think about it when it's adults, right? They think about it when it's kids, but when it's adults, it's not, it's not high on their radar. To, to say to you, hey, are you, are you, do you work around lead? Could, could lead be an issue here? Their, their doctor's not thinking about it. You have to advocate for yourself. The first time I asked my doctor for a blood test, she looked at me like I was crazy. You know, you're not a kid and you don't live in an older home. Right, but I work around this stuff all day long. And then you'll get a number. And once again, don't accept their saying, oh, you're okay. Ask for the number. What's the number? 
you should be carrying a blood lead level of, I don't know, less than five. I mean, it's harder to say with adults, you know, adult OSHA will let you work on the job site until your lead level reaches 50. So I kind of want to go by that. I, I have worked with a lot of lead poisoned adults. My current lead level is zero. It was not always. I had to work at that. But, and I'm in and out of these old buildings all the time. So you do not have to be lead poisoned. All right. Find out what the number is. Give me a call if you want to talk. I'm happy to help. How likely are you to be lead poisoned? Well, you know, it depends on your situation, right? But let's start with your house. If your house was built before 1940, 87%, nine out of 10 of them have lead. And here's the numbers that I just gave you earlier. So how do you know? Now let's talk to, let's talk about the kids for a minute. All right. If you think you might be lead poisoned, great. Call your doctor, get a test. We can talk about how to bring that lead level back down. There are lots of, there's lots of good information out there about it. I, I don't want to start getting into that because it varies so much depending on your situation, but there are ways. And with adults, once you bring a lead level back down, most of us kind of go back to normal, whatever normal was for us. It's different with the kids though. As you've, as you've heard, the kids can have permanent brain damage, particularly if they're under six. We have a, a controversy about how many kids are lead poisoned in this country. We just don't know because like New Hampshire, many states are not testing. I believe that this is a huge problem. And some research is out there indicating if we look at a child as being not just zero to six, but zero to 18, then maybe one in three American children today has lead poisoning. That's a crazy number. I don't know. There's still a lot of research to be done. My point is there's a good bet that there's lead in your house, in your household, even if it's not an old home. So what do you do? Well, to figure out whether the kids are or have lead poisoning or not, you want to test them, right? Same thing. Get a blood test done. Here's some of what I already talked about, but let me talk about testing your house for a minute. There's a, there's some levels of ways in which you can test your house. I would test my kid first right? And see if the kid has a level. But eat, whether they do or they don't, you still may want to test your house because they might be picking it up somewhere else. You'd like to know where are they getting it if they are, right? You want to bring their lead level down as quickly as you can. And there are lots of ways to do that. That's a topic of another day. But again, I'm going to give you my contact information. Call me, email me. I'm happy to talk with you privately about your situation. This is what I do. I'd love to talk about it because, you know, this is how we solve the problem. I want an army of people out there talking about it. The more information I share with you and you share with your family and friends and they share with their family and friends. And that's how we fix the problem. Not with fines and laws but with people, well-meaning, caring people sharing information, right? So I'm, I'm, I want to share so you can share. Um, and, and that's why all the videos and everything are free. Just share them on YouTube or do whatever you want to do with them. So get your kid tested, but let's talk about your house. You could have a full risk assessment done. That would cost a fair amount. Um, I would say, you know, if you're not doing all the lab work, you're not doing all the soil samples and blood tests, you're just testing the painted surfaces in the house, I don't know, three, four, five hundred dollars depends on how big your house is and which lead inspector you call. Uh, you know, give me a call. I'll, I'll give you the names of some people or go to the Department of Health and Human Services website. Gosh, there's a wealth of information there, including a list of all the lead inspectors in the state. Full risk assessment is pretty expensive because it typically does include all the lab work. The next level down would be a lead inspection. So that's the one that you might get for three or four or five hundred dollars. The risk assessment is probably a thousand, fifteen hundred, something like that. You also could do just a dust wipe. There are a number of dust sampling technicians here in the state. They're, they're just, they take a one day class to be certified to do dust wipes. I am one, there are a number of others. And I, I teach that class too. So if you want to get certified, give me a call. I don't think anybody else is teaching that one right now. It's not a real common class, but what it does is it gives you lab results and it costs very little. Um, you know, a, a dust wipe sample might be $20. Uh, to have someone come out and take it in your house might be 50, I don't know. But you can, you can get actual lab results and get a pretty good sense of what's going on. Also, if you are doing any renovation in your house, whether you're doing it yourself as a landlord or whether you're hiring somebody, or I mean, as a private homeowner, or whether you're hiring somebody to do it, you should have RRP certification, certification. That's renovate, repair, and paint. It's a one-day class, cost a couple hundred dollars, but right now it's available for free. Um, if you're in Stratford County, I know Stratford County still has a couple of free classes. I'm anticipating as this grant money hits the state in the next couple of months, there'll be more. Today, we're offering $50 off, so you could get it you know, this week for 150 or something. It's not expensive is my point, and it's a five-year certification, and you will have all 
the information you need to, to, to work safely. Where do I put the plastic? You know, do I wear respirators? How do I clean up this stuff that I can't see? We cover all that. It's an eight hour class, but you'll get a lot of good information. So either take the class yourself if you're doing the work, or if you hire someone, ask to see their RRP certification or their lead safe certification. All right, it should, it should be a, a national certification, EPA, HUD, and it should be current. It should not be expired. Also, you can test your house. Um, oh, so my point about the RRP contractors is they test themselves. Um, yes, Molly. <laughs> Molly from EPA, as you just said, sometimes enforcement is the only way. It is true. Sometimes the, the way that we'll get things started is somebody will come in and find you, uh, find the contractor, and now they'll start paying attention. And that's an eye-opener. Uh, but your, your RRP contractor will test those areas in which they're working. They're not lead inspectors. They can't test the whole house, but they will test the areas in which they're working. And they'll, then they have to let you know. They'll say, oh, you know, by the way, just saying, oh, those windows have lead. That's part of their job, their record keeping is they must let you know. So that's also, if you're having renovations done, a good way to learn about what's going on in your house. And then the do-it-yourself testing. You can buy, of course, test kits in the market. I have to say that there are there are not there are only two that EPA has recommended. They don't even recommend. They um they have approved as you know recognized. That's the word I want. They have recognized as being accurate. Uh, there are only two, and that's the 3M lead check swab, which you can buy on Amazon, and the D lead kit, which I believe you also can buy on Amazon. Um, but you still even if you have those, that doesn't mean you're using them correctly. That's why we really recommend people take the RRP class. I think it's a great class, even for parents. And so if it's offered, you know, if you get a chance to grab it for cheap or for free, I really recommend it um, because it's, a, it's just a good overview of how to work safely. And one of the things we teach you is how to use those do-it-yourself kits correctly because a lot of people don't use them correctly. So if you're going to test, use one of the tests that's recognized by EPA and learn how to use it, right? Now, when it comes time to test your kids, how am I doing for time? Oh, great. When it comes time to test your kids, remember the things you're looking at. You're, you're getting a blood test done, either capillary or venous straw. And I know I've jumped down to the bottom of the list here, but capillary is a finger stick. It's a, a like a lead care two machine, they call it. It's just a quick finger test. It's like a diabetic checking sugar. It's really pretty easy. And um, uh, Bobby, great question. I'll answer. I'll address that in a second. Um, so it's a pretty easy finger stick and you get results in three minutes. You get results right away. If that's high, they're going to ask you to do a venous straw, right? Venous straw is a traditional blood test. And then you'll get a more accurate number. Um, so let me just address what, what um, Bobby asked about the RRP training. That's a certification that once you get it, it's a one-day class and it's good for five years. Then you are EPA and HUD certified. And so the trainer that you go to, whether it's us or one of the others, will have you on record and should reach out to you at the end of about four years to remind you that your five-year certification is about to expire. But even if they don't, you'll have a, an ID card or a certification, a certificate from the trainer, which will say the expiration date on it. So just put that in your calendar and know you want to come take a take a class again in four years, four and a half years. By then, it will all be online. A, a, a good chunk of it's online right now. And you'll be able to do it you know, from home if you want to. Although I think there's always benefit in coming out and working with a training provider. Um, to ask questions, you know, to stay connected. But then you'll then you'll find out what's been what's updated over the last five years since you took the class. So that's a great way. And yes, Molly just posted a link in the chat box about how to locate RRP training in your area. Um, and also check with your grant your folks. Uh, the people who just got grants will will probably be offering some free training. Ask them and see. If not, you know, like I said, it's not a lot of money spread out over five years and considering the safety of your children. Um, yeah, there is no minimum age, uh, actually. That's an interesting an interesting point. Yeah, high school kids take this class. This class is good for everybody. Um, we can't certify abatement contractors under 15, but general renovation, you can take that class um, as a teenager if you want to. So we talked about how the kids got poisoned, right? The friction impact surfaces I already talked about, infants being on the floor, toddlers putting their hands in their mouths, pets. Here's one other step, which is I worry sometimes about cleaning. I think we, we tell people there might be lead dust in your house, be really careful. And they think, oh, I'll just clean it up. And so they get really aggressive about rubbing their sponges on the walls and the windowsills. And the truth of the matter is they're really spreading the stuff around. You know, the, the, the reusable mop and sponge is just not a good cleaning tool when it comes to lead. 
the best cleaning tool is something disposable. So, so we think Swiffer, right? It's a disposable wet cloth. I wipe the area, then I throw that in the trash and the lead goes in the trash with the cloth. But honestly, you can make your own. You know, you can take paper towels and, and you know, put a little bit of cleaning solution on them and do the same thing. Wipe an area, throw it away. I think I say in my, in my TED talk, a wet paper towel beats a sponge any day. Uh, I, and I know it sounds crazy, um, but that's the truth. And, and um, I forget if it was EPA or HUD. I think it was EPA who did a study on what's the best kind of soap to use. And the, and the determination was, it really doesn't matter. Some soap is better than no soap. That breaks up the surface tension of the water. I don't know, stuff is beyond me. But they found that some soap's better than no soap. They found that warm water is better than cold water. But other than that, you can use whatever soap you want. Don't spend a lot of money on, you know, lead cleaning products. It's not necessary, right? Just You just want to wipe up dust and throw it away. And then if you can put a, a good coat of paint on everything, if you can keep the old paint sealed in by new paint, that's a great step. Now, it's not abatement, it's not permanent, but it's a great step for keeping those kids safe. A HEPA vac, right, which is a vacuum cleaner that has a specific filter size and not just any vacuum that says HEPA on it. Sorry, but it's not just the filter. It's the design of the whole vacuum. It has to be what's called a sealed unit. So all the areas where those vacuums click together, we have to make sure that we have um, rubber gaskets. And EPA has a whole standard for HEPA vacs. So make sure that the vacuum that you're buying says HEPA on it somewhere, HEPA approved by EPA, all right? Um, I'll call me if you have questions about this, but a, a good quality HEPA vacuum and wet cleaning is the best solution. All right, I know I'm wrapping up here. I gotta get to the end of my time. I'm gonna be at the end of my time in about five minutes or so. So let me just review what are the five steps. Because I said, I started this book by saying five steps. You know why I said that? Somebody said, you got to keep it really simple. So I said, oh, okay, five steps, we could do that. Of course, I could talk about each step for an hour, but we're just going to summarize right here. Number one, test your kid. Get your child tested. I don't care what age they are. You know the doctor's going to test them in New Hampshire now at age one and age two. That's a great thing that Senate Bill 247 did. But don't ignore three-year-olds or five-year-olds or yourself. You can be lead tested as well. And you should be. You could be lead poisoned. And you could be bringing that poison home to your children. So please, it's a family affair. Get everybody tested. Number two, test your house. If, you're, if you've got people with high lead levels, figure out what's going on. If you don't want to do it with your, your own, you know, do-it-yourself test kits, call a dust, a dust sampling technician or call a lead inspector, call a risk assessor. Um, if you're going through one of these grant programs to have full abatement done, by the way, they will pay for all those inspections. So start off with your grant application if you're thinking about doing that. And reach out to us. We have, um, we're actually, uh, we have a contract with New Hampshire Housing. We actually do intake. I'm the intake person statewide, <laughs> except for downtown Nashua and downtown Manchester. They have their own programs, but call me and I'll give you their phone numbers. Um, we all work together. So if you're interested in the grant program, reach out to us. Um, test, get your house tested one way or another. Number three, talk about this. That's our secret weapon right there. Raise awareness. Talk to the grandparents. Talk to your friends. You know, your children go other places besides your house, right? Once you open the eyes by looking at your house, you'll start to look at grandma's house differently and the babysitter's house and your ex and your friends and wherever the kids go. Think about their schools. Talk to, the, talk to your pediatrician. Make your pediatrician your partner in this. You would be surprised how little training some doctors have. New doctors that are just coming out of medical school, I think have a lot of good training about lead. But doctors who are a little older, who've been practicing for a, a while, I have doctors call me and say, what is it again? Talk to me again about what I'm supposed to do with a kid at this level. It's just hard, you know, it's hard for them. They have so many things to worry about, especially right now when COVID is, is such an important piece of their world. And, you know, they're worrying about what they see as very immediate, very acute things. And sometimes it's easy for lead poisoning to kind of get lost in the training. So, so please uh, advocate for your, yourself and your children with your medical professionals as well. Talk to your landlords, talk to your schools, talk to your contractors. Using lead safe work practices around your house when you're cleaning, being careful that you're not disturbing the paint by being an aggressive cleaner, pressure washing outside the home if it's old houses, it's just not allowed anymore because you're just throwing all this lead dust and chips into the air and the kids will pick it up in the yard and bring it into the house. And if you are having any renovation done, um, please 
please talk to uh, hire lead safe contractors. Uh, talk to me if you're, or go to the list that Molly just posted for uh, our RP trained folks. You don't want to take a chance on this. So here's our, here's my contact information and a list of sort of the things we can do for you. But if you have any questions about lead, just reach out. If I can't help you, I will find someone who can and, and turn you over to that person. We are so lucky to have such a great network of people here. I mean, Nashua is a terrific resource. The State Department of Health and Human Services, an amazing resource. And we have EPA folks that are active in New Hampshire and involved with us, and they're, they're all here to help. You know, we have to uh, we have to just reach out and ask questions. Speaking of which, I think I have five minutes left, so let me be quiet and answer whatever questions you have for me. Thanks, Kate. That was very interesting and informative. Um, so we can now move into the question and answer portion of the presentation. So if you have a question, please write it in the Q and A box. We have a couple questions already. Um, so Bobby Bagley.